afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. This is a prime nap time slot, so I'm gonna try and be as engaging as possible. I'm really excited to be here and present our one year's worth of work in the next 30 to 40 minutes. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions. One of the biggest reasons I'm here is because I wanna learn from all of you. So please ask questions, um, and if you have worked in similar space, then I wanna hear, um, hear from you. So hopefully there'll be plenty of time. And the work that I'm gonna describe today is by no means my work alone. This is a collaborative effort, effort from our entire incident response team at Netflix. Um, we have Mark and Kevin, our responders and engineers, leading the way in automation. And I'll talk a little bit about team structure and how we're doing. So in this talk, you'll, you'll hear about our journey, right? Our journey from creating incidents manually, creating JIRA tickets, to where we are right now, where we have automated a lot of the workflows. Um, there is a lot of work to be done, uh, but we are headed in the right direction. So about me, my name is Swati Joshi. Currently, I'm a senior technical program manager on the incident response team at Netflix. Prior to this, I was at Mandiant. I was a third-party incident response consultant, consultant handling incidents for 20 plus of my clients. Uh, I was an engagement manager. You know, if, if, if there is a problem, if there is an incident, they would pick up the phone and call, call one of us, and we would be there to help our clients through an incident. Um, after that, within, within Mandy and FireEye, I moved to the escalations team, the product escalations team, where we would handle high priority um, escalation. So basically, if there was detection efficacy issues, like the appliances isn't working, they have no view into the environment, and they've gone through regular support channels, and it was, it, if it wasn't working, then we had to handle kind of that hot potato. Um, so I did escalations and then moved to Netflix to do crisis management. Before that, I was at a corporate executive board. Gartner bought that later. I was a senior security engineer there, then an associate director of security, where I managed identity, um, an identity access engineering team, and a few big uh, technical security projects, and also handled um, client engagement. So that's my background. And also, you know, we have the rest of the security incident response team helping me with all of this. We have a really strong, um, um, really strong, we have really strong leaders at Netflix who support taking risks. And you know, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way and course corrected quickly. And that's why I think uh, we are, in terms of automation, making some headway um, in that area. Okay, so are you guys ready? So this is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about incident response and crisis management and the culture of that uh, at Netflix and what are some of the challenges we have. We'll also talk about why did we choose to make the bets that we did? Why did we choose to solve certain automation problems versus others? We'll talk about the entire incident lifecycle. I'll walk you through the automation efforts in each of the um, each of incident phases, what we're trying to do. Then in the end, we'll talk about what are we going to do next, uh, what's on the roadmap, et cetera. So here is our stream structure. We, I'm part of the detection and response team, DNR, which sits under the larger information security team. One of the unique things about our team is each of us are responders. We are all incident commanders. We handle incidents. We also bring something else to the table. Alex is our manager, 
and he also gets on call and helps out with, with our on-call rotation. I'm also a responder. I handle incidents, but I bring program management and product management aspects um, to the team. We have three others who are responders and developers who, who are focused on crisis management and digital forensics, and we are looking for one person in our LA office who's gonna spearhead the studio side of incident response for us. So there is a good mix. One other thing is we all have different backgrounds. Um, Alex was the manager, has worked in government. I come from the vendor side of things. We have another responder who comes from banking, another one from academics, and we have two other people from Facebook and Google so who have like the big company experience. So I think that really helps us as a, as a team because we have such a diverse uh, perspective and we sort of get into these healthy debates um, you know, in terms of, oh, do we want to do this? Why do we want to do this, et cetera? Because we have such different perspectives. Okay. So we have the concept of placing bets at Netflix. So say there are two options, and both of them look equally good to you. We say, okay, we're going to pick one because, you know, A, B, C, and this seems like the good bet to take, so we take that bet. So we said, in our incident response team, we said, you know, we can't really prevent every incident from happening, right? Incidents will happen. But what we want to focus on is, we don't want the same incident happening again. So we want the same, don't want the, the similar kind of incidents happening twice. That means like we haven't done our job really well. And then if the incidents will happen, and they will happen, we want to detect them quickly, contain them quickly, and handle them really, really well. So we, have a, we want a good response program in place so we can handle the incidents that will happen. So there are a um, couple of distinctions that I want to make in terms of our incident response culture. I think some things stand out in our team, and I'm curious from everyone else too if, if you see some of these challenges, right? So we are a small team. We are a team of five, as you saw from our team structure. And um, Netflix has a huge presence. So we try to distinguish between an incident and a crisis. If an incident bubbles up to be a crisis, then the incident response team will go in and provide crisis management support. So what is the distinction? If it's one, say, MacBook that's inf um, infected with malware, you wouldn't see um, uh, the incident response team spinning up an incident and handling that, right? We want our corporate security team, we want our IT support team to step in and take care of that for, for us. But if it needs like a coordinated response, you see some kind of pattern, and you see 50 or 60 of them getting infected, and you see something, something very unique. This seems like a really sophisticated, say, malware or whatever that is. So I'm using all sort of fake examples. Um, if you would see that, then we would step in and say, hey, this is a crisis. We need a coordinated response. Let's get cert in um, to spin up an incident. We also have this fix versus prevent mentality, right? You can't really fix everything. We want to be in, in proactive mode as much as possible, talking to other teams, you know, distributing our uh, incident response best practices. But at the same time, we also need to be really good at fixing the problem. So we do a lot of, uh, you know, wheels of misfortune, what we call, where we'll spin a wheel, it has examples of, um, some really bad incidents, and we'll exercise that muscle um, quite a bit to know, you know, how, how do we fix this? So context versus control. In the Netflix culture memo, it talks about, you know, you really want to work through context and not control. You don't want to control anything, but you want to set the right context. If you're working with someone, explain to them why this is important, why it's in the best interest of Netflix, and don't really try to control the narrative. It becomes a little bit hard when you're responding in a high-stress situation, right? Because the first few 
sometimes minutes or hours of an incident is a scoping exercise. You yourself, do, you, you don't know what's the scope of this um, investigation, right? Is this because of something else? Is it because of A? Is it because of uh, C? You're trying to figure that out. So if you're sort of giving information to a broad audience, it can be taken out of context. So we always try and balance between context and control, trying to get the message right, and share, at the same time, share information openly, but also be careful about it. Good versus bad process. You know, all of us, I'm sure, we we have experiences where we say, you know, like this process is taking really, really long. I'm not effective. I don't know why I have to push paper and this is taking forever. Um, we don't want any process. That also comes with um, some of the negative aspects of it, right? So if there is absolutely no structure, how are you gonna handle a crisis? So we always try to balance that as well. So if it's gonna take us 10 minutes 15 minutes to fill out something, open an application, get, a, get an incident going, we are not gonna follow that process. That just doesn't seem right. We want process, but the good kind. You know, we are not for maintaining a spreadsheet of POCs or, or um, of all of our subject matter experts so we can get them involved in an incident. That's just not gonna happen because nobody is gonna maintain that spreadsheet. That just seems boring work. So, so we say, no, we are not maintaining a spreadsheet. It might take us a couple of minutes to get the right person, but we're gonna accept that risk, right? Um, and for people who are interested, Alex um, wrote a really good blog, blog, uh, blog post about sock versus sockless detection. So as we are growing, our intention is not to just add more people to the team, say tier one, tier two. So we are not going that route. We're going the opposite route. We are seeing we want to make other investments that will help us scale, but without adding to our linear you know, staffing requirements. So you'll hear a few things that we are doing differently that's away from the regular SOC type model. So these are the four enabling pillars of a crisis management program. So if we want to be the center of excellence, right? So how are we doing that? So we're doing it via training, tabletops, guidelines, and tooling. And tooling is the automation, right? So we'll get into more details uh, throughout the presentation. So we have two trainings that we do. Incident commander or incident lead training, we take this training and go to our sister teams, right? Other teams that might call on the incident response team. So we want to enable them and empower them with our tips and tactics and say, hey, here is how we handle incidents. If this incident is in your domain and you don't need our help, if you just want to handle it, we'll train you so you can handle your incidents. And then we do incident participation training. This is for all newcomers, um, especially engineers at Netflix, right? When the incident response team pages you, we want you to know what to do. Here is the SLA. In 10 minutes, we want you actively engaged. We want you to have a laptop. We want you connected into VPN and have access to all of the dashboards that you need to, he to help us with this incident. Tabletops. So this is where we go to different teams and have like a conversational style tabletop exercise, right? We all sit around in a conference room. I throw some scenarios and some injects and we see how, how are we doing uh, with this. After that, we do a post-incident kind of review, even for um, the game day exercise. And a lot of weak links come out of that and we do follow-ups. Guidelines. I'll talk a little bit more about this where we have, you know, in order to handle incidents really well, you have to set up a very strong foundation for that. That means, what are the type of incident severities, right? How are we going to do comms when crisis happens? Who is the backup for this person? So, it, incident is an incident. Um, incident is not the time to figure out all of these things. These need to happen before when you're kind of not fighting it, when you're, you know, it's the, it's the peace time. It's not when you're handling incidents. And then tooling, of course. 
So we'll go through three sort of questions, right? Like why? Why did we, um, why are we choosing the problems we are trying to solve? Then we'll go into what, and then finally we'll sort of lay out how are we, how are we solving it. So you saw in the team structure and spoke a little bit about we are five people, how are we gonna handle you know, the incident load that's coming our way? So I wanna talk to you a little bit about high leverage incident response. So this is the distributed model that we have, uh, we are implementing, where we are seeing, hey, uh, corporate security folks, if this is phishing, if this is specific malware, we need your help to resolve it. If it is vulnerability, then we want application security to handle that. We are focused on attacker activity. If we see whiff of an active compromise, or if we see hey, we have a high degree of confidence, there is something really bad happening here, we want you to take a look, then the incident response team gets in. Otherwise, we rely on our subject matter experts in their own field, be it facilities, be it content security, be it you know tier three, customer service, they're all handling some sort of crisis, but if it gets to a certain threshold, then you call on incident response team to come and help you. So we've, uh, so we've built the distributed model. We are also looking for efficiencies. So we're, we're trying to build an efficiency mindset and saying, hey, if you're spending too much time doing a few tasks, we need to automate it. For example, we saw every time an incident comes up, we have to open a Jira ticket, we have to get a Slack channel going. We have to get a notification group going. We have to send an um, we have to send an invite for a physical war room. So we were doing all of these administrative tasks every time an incident would come up, and we said we don't want to do these things anymore. We want to automate it. So that's our focus. We want to have efficiency mindset, and then we want to scale, right? So we want to try and go to each and every one of our sister teams and say, hey, how can we enable and empower you? Can we train you on how to uh, handle incidents? Can we train you how to do post-incident reviews? Can we train you to do your own game days and tabletop so you're, you're sort of independent? So we are trying to do that. So we, uh, we wanna be the center of excellence for crisis management and then have our escalation points, have our sister teams um, sort of you know, train them and teach them the ropes so they can be more effective in their own way. Sort of going back to what I said before, think of this as peacetime and wartime. Wartime is when you're handling incidents. Incidents are thrown at you, you're just handling them. And during peacetime, you're in proactive mode. You're meeting with people, you are sharing, them, sharing with them these guidelines, you are training folks, you know, so, when I'm handling an incident and I say, hey, um, this is Swati, I'm the incident commander, we are handling SEC 1, 2, 3, 4, this is a medium severity incident. Everybody in the room knows what I'm talking about. So medium severity, you mean, okay, so this is not really high, this is not drop everything um, and work, but this needs my attention, right? So that's clear. So we try and train people uh, to sort of be ready when incident happens and people uh, come in and that collaboration is smooth. So guidelines is one of the biggest things for us to scale, right? So documentation is never fun, but it's really, really important. So we try and sort of get the, we try to get the basics right. So we have an incident severity doc that talks about, we recently changed it, so we had a major, minor, critical, three categories, but we changed that to high, medium, low, because there was some feedback and confusion about, oh, what's really the difference between major and critical? It's a bit confusing, right? So with high, medium, low, it's, it's simple. I had, a, my initial suggestion was to say, you know, major, minor, and crisis, and then, our leadership 
team was like, no, you're not going to call something a crisis. That means we are not handling it well. So, okay, so high, medium, low. Let's, let's go with that, right? So because you, you want to have like an unbiased view, you don't want to set sort of alarms. You don't want to um, shock people or say, oh my God, this is a crisis. But at the same time, you want to convey the urgency and the importance so you get the buy-in and get the participation that you need. And then we have a crisis communications doc where we talk about, hey, if it's a high, medium, low, here is what we are going to do. Here, here are all the people that we want to involve, right? Here is the, the, the leadership team. Um, here is PR and legal. Here, if it's a customer service issue, then customer service team. So whatever the type is, then we want to involve the right folks. We also wrote a few other documents. One of them was when to escalate to CERT. So if you are asking other teams to help us with the low priority incidents, then we want to let them know that, hey, at this point, call us. Um, that way we can help you. So we have um, like a loose framework that discusses when to escalate to CERT. Handoffs in an incident are, you know, encouraged, right? After about eight to nine hours of working an incident, your judgment is really, really affected. So we try to hand off incidents as much as possible. So we wrote a handoff document that says, hey, when I'm handing off um, my incident, say to Dan here, I say, here are the conditions, here are the actions, here are the needs. Now you go handle it, right? So we have the handoff document. We've also built a game day toolkit for our um, partner teams that talks about here is how to run a game day, here is what you could do in the hope that they could run their own. And last but not the least, incident response plan. We all need to have one. So why are we talking about these guidelines, right? So before even we could get started with automation, we had to have all of these documents and templates, what we call down pat. So we had to have all of these written down, ready to go, before we can feed that into our automation. So here are some of the things that we so, sort of worked on and uh, had those ready. So as you can see, we found ourselves copy pasting these documents quite a bit. Every time there was an incident, we wanted an investigation doc. Every time we closed an incident, we wanted to do a post-incident review doc. We wanted to have a Google form or like survey feedback that would, we would send to participants and say, hey, do you have, how was your experience? How was your experience handling or dealing with this incident? What could we have, you know, done better? So we found ourselves sort of working these documents over and over again. So we said, okay, we're going to template all of this. And then at some point when we do our automation, we're going to feed all of this document into our tooling, right? So we have an investigation doc. Every time an incident gets spun up, we have an investigation doc. This is a collaborative document. Everybody that's part of an incident goes in here and starts typing. There is timeline, there is analysis, there is a place for everything. There is, you know, root cause tab if, if we know how this happened. So there are different sections in this document that we start, go, um, start to fill out. We also create uh, a shared drive for all of the participants. If there are any logs, if there are screenshots, any any sort of evidence that's associated, any kind of artifact, all of that goes into this specific incident drive. Um, comms. So we have to send an executive update to our larger audience. There is a template for that that we use. This also breeds familiarity, right? So now everyone knows, okay, if this is an incident, here is how we're going to get an update you know, bluff, bottom line up front, conditions, actions, whatever that is, it's in a specific format. So people get more comfortable with that. And then we have the CAN report. So executive report is more high level for a broader audience. CAN report is more tactical. So this is where, say, in the Slack channel, we're going back and forth. Hey, have you done this? Have you done that? So we're working through the incident. CAN is when the incident commander, the person who's leading the incident, gives a brief update every few hours that we all of us are on the same page. So conditions, actions, and needs. C is for condition that says, hey, here are our current conditions. Here is where we are. Actions. These are the actions that we are taking. 
Somebody is checking the database logs. Somebody is checking the application logs. Somebody is writing um, the executive update. Whatever those actions are, we'll call them out in the action sections and then needs. Do we have like a specific team that's not responding right now? Do we have someone, you know, does our VP need to go give, um, you know, whoever at the C level an update? If there are specific needs that are not addressed, we put them in the needs section. So we do a can report. Post-incident review doc. So every time there was an incident, once we close the incident, we do a post-incident review, right? Like we go through what went well, what didn't go well, how can we improve this, how can we get better? So we have a post-incident review doc. Again, we templated that. That way it's the same every time and we know what sections to fill out and we can use our automation to fill out those sections. And timeline. This was basically, you know, this is really important sort of legal requirement too, to understand when was this detected, who detected this, how quickly did we take action. We are also using timeline to mine for our mean time to resolve and mean time to assemble. We are still in the process of doing that. And then there are a few other templates that we worked on. We also saw that every time we closed an incident, we have to send a post-incident uh, meeting invite, right? And we had to write the content, we have to at attach the docs, and we were like, we are doing this like 10 times a week, we should automate it. So we worked on a post-incident review meeting invite template. It's the same all the time, it just changes the incident number and the document. And then, we also worked on a welcome message. We got feedback from a lot of the participants that, hey, when I just joined the incident, I know, I don't know where all of these things are. Like, I don't know where this investigation document is. I don't know where the incident drive is. I don't know who the incident commander is. So we put together a welcome message that will be sent to folks um, that join the incident that says, hey, here are a list of resources to help you, right? So we had all of that ready, the templates, the guidelines, um, everything that needs to be fed into automation. Then there were a lot of little things um, that we wanted our automation to do, right? Like there were a bunch of things that we were doing them okay, but it would be really nice to add that refinement um, and have a, a really solid process. Decision making, right? Sometimes it, it wasn't really clear, hey, is incident uh, commander the decision maker or are we putting the decision on someone else? And then, you know, how are we gonna get the mean time to resolve? Is there a tool to do that? If I need some, if I need help quickly, do I have to go to pager duty and page people, or can I just do this in the tool that we are using? Um, what about setting clear expectations, right? As an IC, you can say, hey, can you please go get me the answer in the next 15 minutes? But then who is gonna follow up after 15 minutes, right? So there is a lot of cognitive load on the incident commander to do all these little things and keep track of all the things that are going on. So we just wanted to keep in mind all of these little things that need to be done while handling an, in an incident. And it would be great to have some kind of tool to help us with this. So, I'm gonna sort of talk about how we did this automation, right? So it was this huge project, um, and we started down uh, this journey, and piece by piece, we sort of dissected it. Uh, requirements analysis. Um, honestly, nobody was a fan of writing a really long requirements doc to figure out, okay, do we need this or do we need that? Um, but unfortunately, you have to do it. So we sat down and we started a short requirements doc. We said, okay, if money was not a factor, if we could just dream big, what would be the perfect incident response workflow solution for us? So we wrote down everything that we wanted, you know, communication, collaboration, detection, integration, whatever we want. We wrote it 
to be technology agnostic. We said we're not going to consider, oh, we have to use these different types of technologies, or we want this product over this, we want Python, Java. No, we didn't consider any of that. We said, OK, we're going to write the requirements document, take the technology out of it, and we said, this is what we want. This is our ideal solution. So we started with five pages. And then at the end of it, it grew to be 15 pages because we all started getting really, really specific. We said, when we start an inc incident, depending on the incident severity, we want these people added. So we, we got really, really granular. Then we also added some lightweight status. Like we would just change the color of the requirement to um, like blue, if it was really, really in, uh, important. If it was completed, if we already had it, then we changed the um, color to green, right? So there was no status reports, but we used some lightweight um, sort of coloring scheme to keep us all organized. Then we created, after we knew what we wanted, we created a decision log. So we, we, call, so we call them um, buy, build, no-go logs. So basically, these were the options. Do we create a new workflow engine ourselves? Do we buy a source solution? Um, do we use something that exists internally? We had a number of tools, so we could tweak a few to sort of make it work or match our needs. Continue with little scripts that we had run here and there, ad hoc, right? Oh, this, you know, we want to take down something that seems really cumbersome. Let's just write a script. So we had like many little scripts or just do nothing, like status quo, open a Jira ticket, do all of this by, uh, by ourselves. We soon realized by writing the decision log, sort of weighing the pros and cons, right? So we said, okay, what are the benefits of this? What are the risks with this? Um, so we said, here is the benefit, here is the risk. We did all of this, and we picked uh, option two. We said, OK, let's try to buy um, a source solution, but customize it heavily for our needs, and let's see um, how that'll work. So once we have, once we made the decision, we have our requirements, we said, OK, what are we going to work on first? There are a bunch of things that we want, so how do we sort of decrease the scope and say, this is what we're going to work this quarter, this is what we're going to go work on next quarter. What we realized handling a lot of incidents uh, was people with the most context about their domain were key to handling an incident. So people resolve incidents. Um, so what we wanted to do is, who among the tribe had the most knowledge, right? Okay, it, say it was a credit card leak. It, we were say login credit cards that we are not supposed to. You can pick whatever example. Who was the one who has handled this incident before? Or who's the one with the most knowledge of our payment engineering um, infrastructure? They could handle the incident better. So how can we get them ramped up? So there were two questions. People resolve incidents, so how do we get the right person um, to help us handle the incident? And then how can we give them the right information so they, they can get started right away? So we focused on those two things. Incident ramp up was really, really important. We didn't want to give our participants or the subject matter experts a new tool. That would be sort of another barrier, right? They had to learn another tool. We had to invest in training. We had to invest in adoption. Sort of we didn't want to do that. So we said we'll use a source solution, but when, when our participants come in to the incident, we want to have the same seamless sort of experience for them. So we said, OK, here are these two things are priority for us, and this is what we're going to solve first. Oops. So here is our tech stack. This is what we use. We use Slack for collaboration. That's our uh, chat platform. We use uh, Gmail for our email, so we use Slack in email. We use Google Docs, so the investigation document that I talked about, the post-incident review document, and all of the other documents are in Google Docs. 
Uh, we use Google Drive. If you have to create a folder to share um, incident artifacts, we use that in Google Drive. Um, then we're do using Demisto as a source solution. And then we have many more. So we have PagerDuty um, for our paging system. We use Jira to create tickets. Um, and we use Jupyter Notebooks. So we have um, a wide variety of texts that we use. So we want to sort of piece it all together to create one seamless start to end uh, workflow. So we're going to do a quick walkthrough. In the next sort of 10 minutes or so, we'll go through the incident lifecycle, right? So incident creation, incident management, where you're right in the middle of it, you're handling the incident, and then incident close, and that leads to the post-incident review. Um, so this is exactly how we wrote our requirements also, by the way. So we said, OK, incident, creation, what are all the things that we want to have? So we said. Let's find one way to create an incident. Few months ago, it was, you know, anybody could open a Jira ticket or people would send an email. So we were getting incidents in few different forms. We still are, but we're sort of moving in sort of one consistent approach of um, we have internal links for everything, so we call them go links. So you would say go slash and type whatever, and it would show up, uh, it would show you like a Google form. So we said we're going to create a form. So if you do go slash security incident, people can go in, pick three fields minimum, right? What are you seeing? Summary. In your assessment, what's the severity? Do you think this is really bad? You know, what's the bad signal? What is it saying? Is this, do I need to pull over my car and stop working on it right away? So high, medium, low, pick that. It, it populates the time, um, whatever time that you fill in in the form. So you create a Google form. So when you hit submit, all of the other things just happen. So. It creates a Jira ticket. It creates an investigation doc. Depending on the name of the ticket, so we have uh, we decided on like specific nomenclature for all of this, right? So our tickets start with S E C dash followed by four numbers. So we have that we have that number, and the investigation doc has that at the top says Sec one two three four. Then we create an incidents channel with the same name. SEC 1234, and dipping, depending on the severity, if it's a high severity incident, we have a list of people that we definitely want in the chat room. Depending on medium, this is what we want. So we get all of that together. We also have a bot, which we call cert bot. Cert bot also gets added to the Slack channel, because then you can see who's on call. Um, with sort of bang on call, and you can see um, um, kind of the people who are on call from each team, so we can get, get to them quickly. It also creates an incident drive. It creates two Google groups. It creates a tactical group, and it creates a notification group. And even the groups say sec1234 at you know, whatever address. So we'll have two groups, and then it pulls the on call and assigns it. If it sees, OK, Swati is on call from PagerDuty, so it will make the API call for PagerDuty, pull the person, assign it, and then it will send you a welcome message. It will send the incident commander, and it will also send all of the participants a welcome message. So when you hit the form, it creates sort of you know all, all these things that we want. And here are some of the screenshots of how that looks like. It says, hi. You're being contacted because you're in an incident. And here is the link to everything. And here is the welcome email that you get um, associated with that. So this is a sample incident investigation document. You see sort of the, um, the parenthesis there is where, you know, that's, that's automation, right? So automation will pull in and include all of the details um, into this doc. OK, now we have started an incident. You're the IC. You know what's going on. And you're right in the middle of this, right? So what we want to do is, if you want to create a physical war room, so we have one that's assigned on our floor. 
um, we say, oh, that's the room if, if you know, we have, um, there is a specific account associated with that room and we have admin access to that account. So the automation can also create uh, an invite for the war room. It will kick people out who have scheduled the meetings um, in, that, uh, in that meeting room and it will override it and we can have that room um, to discuss our incident. Um, we also, some of these are not yet done. We want to create, like can report right now. The incident commander does the can report themselves. Like we type it in and when we hit send. But we also have plans of reminding the incident commander to say, hey, you haven't done a can report. It's been four hours since the beginning of the incident. Please do one. So in our crisis comms document that I talked to you about, in our guidelines section, we also say if it's a high priority incident, this is how often we'll update our stakeholders. If it's a medium priority incident, it's every six hours. If it's, if it's a low priority incident, we'll just do once every 24 hours or significant change. If it changes or if it closes, then we'll update. So we'll follow the same sort of procedures and the timelines that, have it, that are in our guidelines, and we'll just codify them in our uh, automation. So getting those guidelines and those timing right um, is really important. We were also spending a lot of time um, post-incident to create a timeline and it was um, really getting tedious. We had to make a table, we had to get the exact time, we had to write who's the owner, right? Who did this action? What actions were done? So what we said was, how about if we can just take some of these timelines from the Slack channel? Because everything's happened in Slack, in the incident channel. People are saying, hey, I see, I did this, you know, and then there is a timeline. So what we said is, let's come up with an emoji. So there was a little timeline emoji in Slack. And if you click on the timeline emoji for a specific message, then that will get populated in our investigation doc under timeline. And the first time I did it, I was like, oh my god, I saved just 30 minutes going through the entire incident, coming up with the whole timeline, and then, you know, I was much more relieved when somebody, like the executive swoop, right? Like the VPs come in and be like, how long is this gonna take? Is this fixed yet? I was like, hey, why don't you read the timeline? That's in my investigation document and you'll understand what we're doing here. Um, so it also, we also have like a specific command where we say bang and loop in. And if you say bang, loop in, uh, legal, it'll just get the on-call person and add it to the Slack channel, add them to the notification group. So basically different touch points, it'll just add folks in. Um, so those were the, some of the uh, automation uh, workflows that we did for while handling an incident. And then incident close, after the incident closes, it'll automatically create a post-incident review doc and put it in the same incident drive for you. It will close the Jira ticket, it will close the Slack channel, and it will archive the Slack channel if you want to, if you want to, if the legal team or you want to go back and check something. Um, and it will also send a feedback form for all of the participants to answer a few key questions and say, hey, how was your um, experience? What can we do better? Um, and it will also update the Jira ticket and change the incident phase to say, hey, this is closed. So these were some of the things that we did with uh, incident close. So we did a lot of work and you know, we saw that we were saving a lot of time and then what are we doing next, right? Where do we wanna take our crisis management um, automation work? One thing that we are not doing uh, really well right now is after the incident is done, there are a bunch of post-incident like action tracking uh, we call it post-incident nagging, and we are not good at that. Like, we're not good at seeing what are the different teams, like, wh what kind of tasks are assigned to them, and can we get a status update on, are you guys working on it? Do you guys think it's not important? So if, say, our VP came to me and said, Swati, in the last one quarter, how many incidents have you handled? How many actions came out of that? How many of them are high, medium, low? I don't have a good answer. 
I can tell them how many incidents we handled, but I wouldn't be able to tell them how many post-action items came out of that. So we want to do that. We want to do a post-incident action tracking and just automate it. That way, I don't have to go to different team meetings and say, hey, is this done? Can we collaborate on this? Have you worked on this? Maybe I'll just send a nagging email uh, and keep reminding them that they need to work on this. Metrics. So we don't have a really good handle on what's the mean time to assemble on this incident? What's the mean time to resolve? So we don't really have uh, measurable numbers for this, so we want to focus on that too. Notifications. A lot of people have asked, hey, you know, somebody is working on PCI compliance. They want to know PCI-related incidents. Application security team wants to know if there are payment-related incidents. Um, our privacy team needs to know if there are PII-specific incidents. So we are not really doing a good job of reporting this incident data to different teams that need to know. Right? So we want to use automation um, towards that to build a better reporting and notification structure. Our, one of the ideas around it is we will create a notification-only Slack channel and our cert bot will um, sort of push updates and say, hey, this is for notification only. We don't need your active engagement, but here's what's up. We are dealing, we are handling four incidents right now. We also want to create a self-service dashboard. If I want to notify people, if I want to report on people, then there is a lot of sort of you know, feed and care that goes into it, right? But what if there was a self-service dashboard and it said go slash security metrics and anyone could go there and see you know, what kind of incidents have we handled in the last quarter, um, what are we doing about it. So if all of that was in one pretty dashboard, that, that would be ideal. And I think we also want tags, right? What if we are able to see seasonality? What if we say, hey, September is a really busy time for us for incidents? Like you could see in the last three years, you know, the incident numbers have just gone up. What if we can say, hey, there were five studio-specific incidents in the last quarter? What if we can say in the last one year we handled these many, you know, PII-related incidents? So we want to include some tags um, so it's just easier for us to see and we can inform our teams to make better decisions. Um, I know everyone says don't sweat the details, but we do sweat the details. So we want few sort of nice things in our automation which we're working towards. We want to have as many commands as possible in Slack um, to do our work, right? Because everybody's collaborating and we're handling incidents within the Slack channel, so we want Slack commands. Um, we want to be able to create incidents um, no matter how they come into our inbox. Like right now, we're directing people to go to go slash security uh, incident Google form. Um, and you know, it, it's not always the right experience. If somebody is like panicking and they say, hey, this is a problem, it's like, okay, go fill a form, right? Just, it's okay, but that just doesn't seem like the greatest uh, experience for people. So we want to be able to, hey, if they send an email to our group, um, uh, you know, incident response email, we want to be able to create an incident, you know, boom, with, not just with Google Forms. So whatever kind of inbound we get, we want to be able to create an incident. We also want to onboard our partner teams, right? We want application security using the same workflows. We want content security using the same workflow. So I'm talking to different teams to onboard them to the same tooling. That way, we also get better incident data for our enterprise risk management perspective. Um, I talked about post-incident action tracking, right? After the incident, we have a bunch of actions, and we want to we get better using it. But in the moment, while we are handling an incident, there is also a lot of tasks and reminders that, that go on, right? We want the database team to work on this. We want the application team to work on this. We want legal to work on this. We want PR to give someone else a heads up. So there are a bunch of actions that are going on while we are handling incidents. We also want to automate that. That way it sort of reduces the burden on the incident commander. So that's on our roadmap as well. Um, and we want to do sort of, you know, a lot of refinement 
We want to ha have the same user experience when you get the welcome message. We want the format to look really nice and the same. When you get an email, we want it to look the same. When you get an executive update, we want for it to look the same. So basically, we want to treat this as a product that has the same look and feel. So it's familiar, it's repeatable, and it's scalable. OK, so that's it. That was on our roadmap. So I want to encourage everyone to sort of go out there, build really strong uh, security programs, work on automation, and keep watching Netflix. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so please uh, take this opportunity to ask. This, this was a great talk, so take, take a chance to do that, please. Yes. So in, I was very interested also in the Netflix culture where you're doing context versus uh, control. In the escalation going into an incident, how much of that is formed by the context of the various units to protect the original effects of the incident? And how much is actually done through the response team when you recognize something has to be escalated? Very good question. So we try and use context, and we try and say, hey, you know, everybody's responsible if the team knows that, hey, this is kind of going beyond our lane here. This is going beyond our expertise. Let's just go get the CERT team to help. But I have seen situations where I've gone and say, hey, can you please hand off command? Because you can clearly see this person is sort of overwhelmed or this team is kind of scrambling. So there have been situations where we've inserted ourselves and said, hey, if we get to know about it, we say, hey, can you please hand off command? We can help you, but we still need your help, but we can run the show. So we try to drive it as much as using context, but we have, sometimes we use our command presence or control a little bit when it's needed. Hey, Kim. Well, I think uh, oh. Oh. one of your first slides mentioned uh, limit blast radius, and that's a, a challenge for us as far as severity and measuring that blast radius? How do you quantify, quote unquote, blast radius of an incident? Yeah, very good point. We try and balance this also. What we say, we try and follow need to know, right? So if there is someone, if application security needs to know and we need their help, who is the on-call person from application security and we'll get them in. If there is someone from legal that needs to know, who is that? Instead of just having all three people. Um, we've had some challenges where people will say, hey, I just want to hang out or I just want to be on the call. It becomes really difficult for incident commanders if it's more than seven people. And there is, you know, there is, there is research to prove that if it's more than seven people, it, 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 it's a crowd and crowd controlling becomes a problem. So we push back sometimes. We say, hey, you want to be, why do you want to be? on the Slack channel. Can I add you to the notification group? So you will still know what's going on, but you're not added in the tactical group. That's why we created those two groups. Tactical is only who's helping us handle the incident. Notification is everyone else who wants to know about it. Hey, Kim. Hey. So we often have been trying to work with companies starting automation, and we say things like, try to use it to triage and prioritize, right? To, so that people are handling what people need to handle. And I wanted to sort of ask you a question related to that. You've clearly done that. You have a view of joint priority across the company. How hard was it to get that? Not write the document, but actually get all those teams to say, this is a medium, and a medium means this is important to you, and you have to do this. Because in some ways, that joint priority has allowed you to delegate, and things are getting handled faster, sooner, because they're not going through the bigger process. The bigger process is for the things that have the most impact to the company. So I just wonder if you could ex talk about getting a joint priority across those teams and what it maybe took. Yeah, um, it was not easy. So a year and a half ago when I joined, um, when the team was really small, a lot of people didn't know about severity, right? People would think, oh, this is an incident. Oh, suddenly, like, all hands on deck, right? Like, no, this is not a high-priority incident. So we didn't want to be in a situation of cry wolf. Every time we said incident, incident, everybody would spend a bunch of cycles. And when it was actually bad, 
we didn't get the level of urgency that we um, needed. So what we did was we have a separate team called the core team that handles availability incidents. So they handle if Netflix streaming service is up or down. So if it's down, then they're the ones handling it. And that team was within the organization. It's, it's, it's existed for a while, right? Because they're on the infrastructure side. And we said, we are gonna follow the same severity uh, model that they have. So they had major, minor, critical, and we said, they had major, minor, and we added critical. We said, okay, we're gonna follow the same format because everybody in the company already knows about it and is familiar, but now, a year and a half later, we've gotten enough traction, and we saw that the same severity rating doesn't really work for us, so we've changed it. But it's pretty much grassroots, going to different teams, talking to them, um, presenting at different sort of, um, you know, company-wide meetings. So it, it, it's just manual. Our work has been manual. Uh, you just mentioned one, but uh, would you mind talking about some of the kinds of security incidents that your team has had to respond to? Um, maybe some that are, I mean, there's some that everybody faces, but then maybe you guys have some special ones. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously, we make a lot of edgy content, right? And not everyone's happy with the kind of content that we have put out, so you can think that there is some resistance in that, um, in that format. Um, we are a big cloud shop, right? So anything associated with cloud, right? Like, you know, exposed S3 buckets is always on top of our priority list. Like, we don't want to do that. Um, Anything like um, internal, if you're logging something that we shouldn't, we see that. Um, we, have, we have obviously automated a lot of things, especially with, you know, you know, catalog surfing was a thing, right? Like, a bunch of bots will go through, try and do catalog scraping, go through our service, and we've built some um, solutions to thwart that. So, yeah, those are some of the, some of the examples that we see but it does keep us interested in. Oh. Hello. One, hi. Um, are you a heavy Palo Alto shop? And if not, are you worried about their uh, purchase of Domesto? We are not a heavy Palo Alto shop. And uh, yeah, we are not very concerned about that. You don't foresee any problems with like integrations moving forward? No, we haven't seen it yet, but I guess market will tell us or the time will tell us. Right, cool, yeah. thank you. Yeah. We have time for one final question, if anybody else. Well, then I'll take the prerogative. Oh, wait, Just go, please go. Hi. Hi, you mentioned, um, you know, for your automation workflow, you were using Demisto. I'm curious about, like, for example, you mentioned when you wait like four hours and send a reminder for a CAN report. How do you do that? Is that like multiple playbooks that you have and then they sleep for four hours or, yeah. Chen, we have a couple of playbooks. We have a crisis management playbook that does all of during the incident and we have an incident creation playbook and then we have a post incident review playbook. We do use sleep and we also do like intervals, like we do polling. Uh, if we need, if you want to send a welcome message to everyone who joins in, right? So sometimes people join in like four minutes after the incident created. Sometimes people join in after an hour. Sometimes, you know, the investigation moves and we say, hey, we need more teams, right? So it'll keep sort of polling and that's how we do it. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. So you focus here on automation of some of the incident response artifacts. And then you just mentioned uh, from one of the earlier questions, if you have like a publicly exposed S3 bucket, is, do you interface with other automation platforms to actually mitigate, or is that part of your, your workflows or playbooks? Good question. So right now, our focus is like efficiencies, building efficiencies within our incident response workflow. So we haven't done really, uh, we haven't done any sort of hooking into other technologies. But one of the motives behind getting one platform was the security operations or the cloud infra uh, infrastructure team is also using Demisto, and they're responsible for like Canary tokens or like Honey tokens, that kind of work. So in the future, we do want to. We're using the same, same platform, so hopefully hooking up with that and creating a response playbook would be easier. 
Okay, uh, with that, please uh, give a hand to Swathi Joshi for her presentation from Netflix.